England and I wrote an article on medieval spies about, uh, <laughs> about 40 years ago. Chris was at the back there. So when I asked Chris his mm. name, and he told me, I said, oh, well, oh you're the pirates, man. <laughs> now, uh, I knew Chris because in 1979, um, his essay <clears throat> on um, piracy... Um, uh, sorry, what was the title? Uh, piracy or policy? Piracy or policy? Uh, the crisis in the Channel, 1400 to 1403, was the Alexander Prize-winning essay for that year. So he's a man who knows all about pirates. He tells me that this talk today is going to be his pirate swan song. So I don't know what that means, but I'm, I'm desperate to find out. So I'll hand you over to Chris. Thank you, John. <coughs> Can you hear? At the back. Um, first, very quickly, an apology. Anyone feeling queasy at the thought of databases and flowcharts? I am going to assure you that I will not be discussing software issues related to databases. I have put some handouts on the end of the table. Some of you have grasped them. Please look at them. If you want to talk about any of the issues, do ask me later. But that's the last database issue for this morning. Um, at a conference celebrating one important anniversary, I hope it's not wrong to mark another, perhaps less well known, the 130th anniversary of the publication of the first volume of Wiley's <coughs> History of England under Henry IV. In particular, I would draw attention to the cha chapter entitled The Pirate War. Using evidence from the then uncalendared patent and close rolls, Wiley painted a vivid picture of a world in which Gangs of desperados, <laughs> their individual names now known to us all too well, issued forth from the ports of the south coast, preying almost exclusively on the shipping of so-called friendly nations. The impact of this chapter cannot be overstated. To this day, indeed, works both general and specialist, touching on the opening years of the 15th century, reflect Wiley's analysis of what is generally acknowledged as one of the most disturbed periods at sea in the later Middle Ages. But Wiley had more to say than this. His analysis continued with the remark, with the trading ships of France, there was constant warfare. The implication clear that constant piracy against friendly nations and warfare against France were somehow interrelated. Curiously, however, this idea was not developed by later writers. Indeed, in 1962, Richard Vaughan wrote pithily of this period, there emerged two distinct threats to the maritime trade of Northwest Europe, piracy and renewed Anglo-French hostility, effectively stressing the separation between them. Pistono, following Vaughan, makes this separation his main theme in a series of articles on the impact of piracy on Anglo-Flemish relations. A revisionist view um, that identified many of our desperados as being the very men to whom Henry IV turned to provide naval assistance as war with France, albeit undeclared, resumed in the spring of 1402. This view runs counter to that of Pistono and following him, Roger. Both acknowledge the Crown's dependence on such men, but argue that they actively exploited that relationship with the Crown to continue unchallenged their piratical activities against friendly shipping. Their arguments further concluded that Henry IV, the usurper, was a weak king whose authority was not fully established and whose orders could therefore be ignored. Strong fleets, I quote, strong fleets with effective fleet, str excuse me, strong kings with effective fleets did not need or want piracy and suppressed it ruthlessly. Weak kings with few or no naval resources of their own were obliged to tolerate piracy. These arguments have gained strong currency. Indeed, it is difficult to find any account of the per this period that does not talk of pirates and piracy. I propose this morning to question the validity of such arguments. I will refocus on Wiley's remark about constant warfare with France to demonstrate that it is in the volatility of the political relationships of England and France and the manner in which that in turn impacted on France's allies, the so-called friendly nations, that we will find a different understanding of the troubled state of affairs at sea in this period. The, ev the, ev excuse me, the evidence available in a recently completed database will underpin these 
investigations. Our period is dominated by the existence of the 28-year truce, 1396, between France and England, inherited in 1399 by the new king, Henry IV. Despite the reconfirmation of the truce by both sides, political relations between the two kingdoms deteriorated rapidly, and the truce came to be ignored in practice for much of Henry IV's reign, before finally being torn up by Henry V with the invasion of France in 1415. The renewed war from spring 1402 onwards was played out very largely at sea, and merchant shipping of both sides became once again the unfortunate prey. <coughs> The renewal of war left France's allies, Castile, Flanders and Brittany in particular, in a difficult position. Though nominally covered by the truce, in practice their merchant fleets too became the target of English fleets, searching not just for enemy shipping, but also inevitably for enemy cargoes in whatever ships they might be carried. And so another key feature of this period is the manner in which these allies of France sought to protect themselves from the renewal of war, by negotiating separate truces or safe conducts with England. Over the 20-year period, many such ancillary truces were negotiated, some enduring longer than others. Much as we've come to accept that the scale of attacks on merchant shipping in this period is particularly high, my opening remark is that we have been considerably misled. Whereas some 40 incidents from the Chancery Rolls have been referenced in print, the total of them, for the reigns of Henry IV and Henry V, exceeds 170. And this figure is dwarfed by the number of incidents that emerge from a study of more than 30 separate lists of truce infractions delivered at different times by ambassadors and truce conservators of the various parties. The database that now contains all this material has details of more than 650 separate incidents. But even this is not the full scale of Wiley's pirate war. Once observance of the truce by France and England ceased in 1402-3, the losses suffered by merchant shipping of the two main protagonists are simply not recorded. They are the result of war. They become the spoils of war. This negative data, albeit unquantifiable, has a, has a significant part to play in this story, which I will return to later. The process of entering into the database the two data streams, chancery records and truce infraction lists, required a sig significantly more focused examination of the contents of the material. In brief, both sets of data are the product of a truce environment, one of the many mentioned earlier. What is recorded in more or less detail, are the circumstances of individual incidents. Names of victims, of ship owners, masters, of merchants, their cargoes, names of alleged perpetrators, all incidents identified quite clearly as infractions of whichever truce is applicable. In no manner are the incidents described as criminal acts. No laws are said to have been broken. No punishments are indicated. They are truce infractions, nothing more or less. Underpinning both sets of data is a common expectation that once the circumstances have been verified, a resolution of the incident and restitution or compensation for the losses will occur. The two sets of data only rarely overlap. The truce lists are the product of a mechanism of truce preservation through appointed conservators, typically port officials, admiralty officers. The chancery records appear, for the most part, only where the truce has no such mechanism. The, process involved, the processes involved with inquiry and judgment differ in complexity between the two different sources. With the truce conservator records, the process, the process usually involved an exchange of lists of incidents between the parties to allow for the circumstances to be examined on the ground, to be followed by a formal meeting when discussions continued with the aim of agreeing a decision on resolution. 
On many occasions, the presence of both victim and perpetrator, or their proctors, was required. Even if in reality, one or other side, and sometimes both, failed to show up and defend their case. Many of the lists bear annotations by the other side, which reveal the thinking processes behind the decision-making and are for that reason invaluable. The Chancery records, on the other hand, reveal a significantly more sophisticated process of resolution, inquiry and resolution at work. We are fortunate that a large number of the original petitions of aggrieved merchants and ship owners have survived, for these often give the most detailed accounts of the incidents concerned. It was these petitions, when accepted, that triggered the orders and commissions of inquiry, and that ultimately the formal inquisitions of which unfortunately so few survive, that make up this process of resolution. The dating of all this chancery activity demonstrates a speed of response to the complaint that belies any notion of weak kingship. And whilst not every complaint follows the smoothest course, or, or the almost direct path to completion, or indeed delivers the expected determination, it is in many of the problem cases that we approach an understanding of the debates that could rage over whether an incident con constituted an infringement of the truce or could be claimed as spoils of war. <coughs> Such debates were, the, were an inevitable consequence of the political volatility of these years, <coughs> with periods of truce alternating with periods of war, but other deeper-seated issues also played a part. Looking at the majority of truce infraction incidents for which we have detailed merchant and cargo information, it is clear that it was common practice in this period for merchant shipping charters to involve multiple merchants, sometimes working in partnerships, sometimes alone, each with relatively small cargo commitments, but across multiple vessel charters. Both ship owners and merchants in such circumstances could often be of different nationalities. Whilst the spreading of risk made absolute sense at a period when vessels were as prone to storm damage and shipwreck as to enemy attack, such diverse ownership of ships and their cargoes presented its own issues in terms of the definition or interpretation of what could be claimed as spoils of war. Typical debated scenarios involved the potential status of enemy shipping carrying friendly goods, friendly shipping carrying enemy goods, goods purchased from enemy ports, goods sent to enemy ports, especially if those goods, goods could be classified as arms, armaments, food supplies, anything indeed that could bolster the enemy war effort. And of course, perhaps the oldest problem of all, the disguising of enemy goods as of friendly ownership. That such debates were of more than academic concern is illustrated in the tortuous negotiations between England and Burgundy for a separate treaty of commercial neutrality between England and Flanders, quote, in time of war with France. Over two years, 1405-1406, endless negotiations were devoted to the fine-tuning of definitions for exactly these issues, searching for forms of words that would provide transparent and workable solutions for merchant shipping, while still securing the necessary approval for these treaties from the King of France. Resolving the potential ambiguities presented by endless permutation of such scenarios formed part of the routine work of any inquisition or other process whose task was to rule on which elements of a ship seizure could be classified as spoils of war and which would be accepted as covered by truce. An illustration from very early in our period, July 1402, suggests that such ambiguities ran deep. In April 1402, Harry Pay of Poole lost three of, his, three of his merchant ships to a joint French and Basque fleet operating off the west coast of France. Two months later, a, flit, a flotilla under his command seized off the Isle of Wight a Biscayan vessel from Bermeo, with a cargo owned by merchants of Catalonia. Henry IV issued orders for the release of the goods, and here the calendared patent roll entry records, if it be found 
that the said goods and merchandise are not wreck of the sea and belong to good and faithful merchants and not to the king's enemies of Scotland. The actual patent roll entry continues, quote, or to other persons who are said to have offended and attacked the king's lieges of England against the terms of the present truce. Such ambiguity could and did create an enormous potential for conflict of interest between victim and perpetrator, one seeking to deliver evidence of truce cover, the other justifying spoils of war. This, said, this, suggests, in, excuse me, this suggests in turn that goodwill needed to be a key element in truce preservation. Its absence, for whatever reason, destroyed any benefits a truce ought to provide. I propose to look briefly at the data provided by the sets of truce infractions ex lists exchanged between conservators of England and France, the two principles of the truce between 1401 and 1403, to show how that lack of goodwill could be discerned in the data. The English lists that have survived record English losses up to August 1403, whereas the French lists only reach to August 1402. Whether their final list has been lost or whether it was never compiled cannot now be determined, but the fact that French troops had just taken part in a Scottish invasion of England certainly suggests that French adherence to the truce was minimal and that the latter was the case. The data from 1401 displays a distinct pattern of activity. The truce was clearly being observed up to a point, but an initially small number of incidents appeared to have triggered a cycle of mutual retaliation that produced a rapid escalation in numbers. Much of the work of the Conservatives at the 1402 meetings involved trying to unravel these retaliatory cycles, and a significant amount of paperwork remains to show that activity. What was clearly missing, however, was the goodwill necessary to resolve these issues, and we will, after you have, became the fallback position of both sides, such that nothing of substance was achieved. The 1402 French list, in addition to recording their own complaints, also included sections devoted to complaints forwarded to, them, forwarded to them by their allies, in particular Bretons, Castilians and Flemish. As happy as the French conservators were to submit all these claims to the English, when the English conservators submitted complaints of losses inflicted on them by France's allies, the data annotations show that these were rejected out of hand. Together, those rejected in this way make up a sizable proportion of English, com English claims, given that French, Castilian, Breton fleets were almost always working in unison. The lack of goodwill visible in the truce conservator meetings was echoed in the ambassadors' meetings held concurrently. English attempts to strengthen the truce, in particular by providing conservators with increased powers of enforcement, were strongly resisted by the French and the changes finally accepted in 1403 were ultimately meaningless, as the truce itself was by now universally ignored. The failure of the truce apparatus to deliver any prospect of recovery of their losses meant that French and English victims increasingly resorted to retaliation, <coughs> and at this point, our data disappears. Spoils of war, whether in retaliation or as a speculative venture, leave few records. How then did France's allies, the friendly nations, cope as the Anglo-French truce conservation route ceased to operate and war returned between the main protagonists? The case of Flanders has already received attention from Pistono and his conclusions, taken up by Roger and others, need con serious consideration. It is his view that Flemish losses at sea to West Country Sea Rovers, operating outside the control of a weak king, led Philip of Burgundy to retaliate against England by seizing its shipping and goods in Sloys Harbour in April 1403. <coughs> to support his arguments, Pistono made use of two of the Flemish truce lists that have been used to populate the database. His use of this material is problematic. He appears to recount across five closely related articles, 
32 separate incidents involving Flemish subjects. In fact, by dint of multiple repetition, only 16 incidents are actually discussed, and this out of a total of 64 incidents in the two lists, a mere 25% of the data. Such opaque selectivity undermines trust. Furthermore, Pistono takes no account of the wider political background, specifically the renewal of war between England and France at the precise moment, May 1402, that Flemish losses begin to appear. Neither does he give any account of the processes of restitution that rapidly resolve many of the incidents that he has cited. And while he also made clear that French, excuse me, while also made clear that French enemy goods were the real prize for English fleets. Rather than considering whether or not Philip's action at Sloys was justified, I propose rather to reveal the repercussions of the Sloys seizures. Customary maritime law, truce legislation, agreed diplomatic practice, all of these required certain procedures to be followed in a conflict such as this. Standardised periods of grace, um, periods of dialogue with the aim of finding compromise, in the case of formal letters of mark and reprisal, strict procedures to be followed, perpetrators identified so that only they were targeted in reprisal. None of these conditions were met. All this was pointed out to Philip in the aftermath of his intervention by his own subjects, as much as by the English crown and its diplomats. But Philip remained quite unmoved. Perhaps half a dozen Sloy's ship owners benefited from Philip's act, re receiving shares in the confiscated English and Irish goods as compensation for their losses. But for the remainder of the maritime community of Flanders, it immediately lost any protection that the truce might otherwise have brought. Flemish requests for resolution and restitution disappear from the record. The English blamed the four members for duplicity and the bond of trade between them was broken. English merchants abandoned Sloys and Flanders in favour of the safety of Middleburg in Zeeland. For the English diplomats, prior restitution of Sloys goods became an absolute condition for talks that were still being debated in Henry V's reign. This was a brutal, unilateral, very cleverly focused intervention at a moment of already strained political relationships, whose impact served only to exacerbate them. The absence of goodwill towards a truce process was undisguised. The example of Castile, France's main political and military ally, displays a remarkably similar process. The database evidence reveals an arc of Castilian truce infraction losses mirroring very closely those of Flanders, and for the very same reasons, the gradual escalation of war and the disregard of the truce. Castilian, especially Basque and Galician fleets, played a very significant part in the shipping of French wine cargoes from La Rochelle, in the supply of foodstuffs from southern Europe, and of course in the supply of iron and steel for French shipbuilding and armaments enterprises. It was inevitable that with the renewal of war, their vessels would be stopped in the search for French cargoes. And of course, any cargoes deemed to be, to be supporting the French war effort would be identified as spoils of war. As with the Flemish, the number of Castilian losses are very small in comparison to French and English losses to each other. And a process of incident resolution and restitution is apparent in the Chancery records, focusing invariably on questions of cargo ownership and purpose. Indeed, we do have a number of Castilian petitions which have all been altered in the same hand at the exact point where cargo ownership is being described. What the erased sections contain cannot now be determined, but the new insertion notes in every case that the cargoes belonged, quote, to merchants of Spain. That English losses to Castilian shipping were also occurring at the same moment cannot be denied. Though the exact data is less complete, oblique references abound, and the diplomatic meetings with, between Spain and uh, between Castile and, and England throughout 1403 revolve essentially around the mutual resolution of incidents. <coughs> 
that is, until a large number of English ships were seized, quote, by ministers of Spain and delivered to diverse people of Spain in restitution. As with Philip of Burgundy's seizure of English goods at Slois, this Castilian retaliation had the same end result, an end to a truce no longer respected. At this point, as Castilian losses disappear from the truce record, truce infraction record, Castilian war galleys appear off the south coast of England looking, we are told, for Ari Pay of Pool. The creation of the database that underpins this research involved the bringing together in a searchable format all the data, both existing and new, concerning incidents at sea in a, at, at, excuse me, at sea in a 20-year period at the start of the 15th century. The information it contains has permitted a new look at what Wiley called the Pirate War. I'll take just a moment to focus on its most significant features. The database has revealed more than 650 incidents, each a story of individual interest, certainly. But beyond those, one story of major significance has emerged. The whole evidence base, chancery records, truce infraction lists, demonstrates that none of the incidents merit the description piracy, and that it is only a fundamentally mistaken interpretation of the nature of the evidence that has allowed that description to continue unchallenged. Each incident in the database is in fact a record of a truce infraction, nowhere described as a criminal act. Each demands or reveals a process of, of resolution and restitution. Each shows individuals, perpetrators and victims being required either to account for their actions or to provide evidence of their ownership of cargoes and ultimately to make restitution or provide compensation if required to do so. Furthermore, the database evidence and the negative data associated with it reveals quite clearly the moment at which niggling numbers of truce infractions swelled to a storm that meant war had resumed between England and France. This resumption of the conflict inevitably meant that many of the truce infractions never reached a conclusion. Losses became spoils of war. What then of the gangs of desperados of whom Wiley talked and who, in the intervening years, we have got to know so well? Certainly, the database attests to their presence but it also suggests that their naming as perpetrators in incidents cannot always be trusted. Enough evidence emerges to demonstrate that phrases like Hawley and his accomplices were used somewhat casually merely to provide a name when failure to do so risked seeing a complaint discarded for lack of information. Better any name than no name. Furthermore, it is quite clear that to consider these men individually is unhelpful. One example will suffice. A small English flotilla captured the Mary Knight of Slois in 1402, excuse me, 1408. The six English vessels sharing 34 ship owners between them. And more than half of them were Dartmouth men and not one of them was John Hawley. Um, in reality, our infinite, excuse me, our infamous characters are but a small handful compared to the hundreds of many different nations revealed by the data. But the most surprising revelation of all is seeing the same names recorded in the data on the one hand as perpetrators and on the other as victims, be that as ship owners, shipmasters, or as merchants. This evidence requires us to rethink entirely our understanding of this period. Pirates and desperados will no longer do. The more than 2,500 names in the database 
provide a snapshot of a series of maritime communities, English, French, Flemish, Castilian, each facing up to the challenges of a renewal of war, seeking profits of war as speculation, but also as retaliation to cover their own losses to the enemy. And as a final thought, amongst those names, there were some thoroughly nasty men. Thank you.